to worry, we will always produce a recording afterwards. And welcome to our um, Wilsdon Green past and present lecture. And this um, presentation is part of a program called Being Brand Heritage for Health and Wellbeing. And it is a project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and delivered by Brent Museum and Archives. And as part of this prog program, we are doing three uh, routes, Wilsdon Green, Queen's Park and um, the Welsh Harp, um, in-person tours and also online presentations. They are uh, slightly different um, in that when we are on the tour, we look at a particular landmark and talk about the history of that and in my online lectures I tried to um, tell the story of the particular area in chronological order so if you uh, have been to the walking tour or are planning to go to one it will be um, a bit different from the online presentation. Um, so the um, history of Wilsdon Green. Um, the actual tour covers quite a short um, uh, part of Wilsdon High Road from um, the underground station uh, to about um, St Andrew's Church on Wilsdon High Road and I decided to concentrate on that particular bit of Wilsdon Green as um, the main subject of this presentation. Uh, the story of Wilsdon itself is of course much bigger and much longer and hopefully Brent will allow us to do many more presentations of that to cover everything in the future. And we start with the Wilsdon name itself and Wilsdon comes from the Anglo-Saxon for uh, Wellesdune which means the hill at the foot of the spring and it is difficult to say exactly where the hill was and where the um, spring um, but there are various um, candidates for that and we'll come across them during our presentation. Um, at the time of Anglo-Saxons and for quite a few years afterwards, um, Wilsdon was uh, scattered hamlets, clearings in the woodland, established in the woodland on elevated and well-drained sites and in between there were streams and wells. And that was for many, many years. And you can see on this map here, uh, this is a map of 1750. And Wilsdon Green is the little bit in the middle. And Wilsdon, sort of bigger area. And Wellesdone, um, with that funny spelling, is actually mentioned way back in 1086 in the Doomsday Book. Um, by the 14th century, there were farms, houses and uh, a village green, which a village green, as you probably know, is a common land, um, often with a lake or some kind of watering place where the villagers could bring the cattle to graze on the common land. And um, around the uh, fields uh, belonged to various farms. And... Um, the uh, oldest area, the oldest, um, if we go back there, you can see St. Mary's Church over there was probably the oldest part which we recognize now. And it has a very interesting history attached to it. Um, it starts with King Athelstan, who was the grandson of Alfred the Great. And in the, ten, in the beginning of the 10th century, he was fighting the Viking, Vikings. At some point, apparently, in, about, in 1937, he had a huge victory over the Vikings in the north of England at Brunnenberg. And he was quite happy that the battle went his way. He defeated the Vikings and he was returning back with his troops to the south of England. Um, but he did realize that his victory was uh, largely due not just to his prowess 
or the bravery of his forces, but to the powers and intervention of God. So, when he was walking past a hill and a spring by the foot of it, here um, in the wilderness of Wilsdon, he saw some monks of St. Erkenwald praying by a small chapel. And he decided as a um, gesture of thanks to the God, to God for his victory over the Vikings, to give the manners of Wilsdon and Nisden to the monks of St. Erkenwald who later became Dean and Chapter of St. Paul's, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And uh, this is a very interesting legend, but now um, there have been some doubts whether it was true or not, and whether the charter that granted those lands um, in 1938 was actually um, authentic. But let us not get the truth, get in the way of a good story. I would like to remember King Athelstan in Wilsdon anyway. And those monks, um, they were praying by the church, which became St. Mary's. And it is the oldest parish church in northwest London. It is quite a long way from the little area of Wilsdon Green that we're looking at. But it is very important for our st story because this was from the uh, 1250s, the site of a famous um, Black Madonna. And Black Madonna is a very interesting concept. It's worth looking it up on um, Google or in a book, whatever. And apparently there are quite a few Black Madonnas all over the world. Um, in Barcelona, there is quite a famous one. And in Poland, there is one as well. And uh, it is just a sculpture of the Virgin Mary, which is black in color. And there are various um, ideas and... Um, schools of thought why it is black or called the Black Madonna. But we had one in Wilsdon and it became a site of pilgrimage. Um, the little church of St. Mary's also had a well with healing water. Again, this uh, concept of a well could be just a good story. There isn't really a scientific, uh, historical evidence that there was actually a well there at the site of the pilgrimage. Um, but a lot of pilgrims came and if we look at the map, where's my map? Oh, um, St. Mary's was somewhere here. And this road here was Watling Street, the famous Roman road, um, which later became Kilburn High Road, Shoot Up Hill is Cricklewood. But at the time, even before the Romans, this was a major thoroughfare, so people could travel to London from it on, on this road. But to get from this road across to the pilgrimage church of St. Mary's, people had to go through the clearings in the woods and roads which were often full of um, highwaymen robbers and anyone who wanted to get hold of a bit of loot. So it was not actually such an easy journey, although it was not that far from London. It was still quite perilous, especially on the last legs of it. By the 16th century, Wilsdon uh, and the Black Madonna became quite famous and it became um, quite big pilgrimage sites. The monks of St. Mary's never got very rich because the lands technically belonged to St. Paul's Cathedral, so all the money that the pilgrims brought must have gone straight to them. Um, but nevertheless, it was an important site. And what happens to it in 1538, um, during the Reformation, at the orders of Henry VIII, uh, the dissolution of the monasteries, the Black Madonna, together with the um, images from Walsingham, was dragged to Chelsea and burnt there. The um, little church of St. Mary's continued as a parish church for Wilsdon, but by the end of the 19th century it was decided to bring back the famous statues. 
and there was one installed in St. Mary's Church in Neesden, that's the old church, at the turn of the century. And then in 1972, um, the church commissioned a new statue of Black Madonna by a sculptor called Cathani Stern. And she made this amazing figure, which is ebonized wood. It's sort of special raisin uh, that's, it's not painted, it's made of wood, but then it's ebonized, a special raisin that's um, melted into it and makes it black in color, installed in St. Mary's Church. Now, St. Mary's Church is an Anglican church, Church of England, and it has the two st statues there, uh, this one and also from the Victorian times. But there is also another church dedicated to Virgin Mary with its own sculpture of the Black Madonna, and that's the Roman Catholic Church, which is called um, Our Lady of Wilsdon, and it is in Nickel Road in Halsden, and that one's slightly older. So actually Wilsdon has two um, Black Madonnas. The reason it is this story is important for um, our story of Wilsdon Green is because the very first community who were coming to this area um, was actually the pilgrims who came to I see the statue of the Black Madonna, so they were like the first, um, our first of our visitors. So, going back to the ownership of the land by St. Paul's Cathedral, this map in 18 of 1823, uh, pre Bendel lens is the ones that's covered in horizontal uh, line, in, in vertical lines. Sorry, that's our area, Wilsdon Green. Um, when St. Paul's Cathedral uh, got the lands, they divided them into prebendary estates. And prebendaries were the um, officials of St. Paul's Cathedral who held a certain position and were rewarded for the services they did by the income of the lands that cathedral owned. Among the 30 prebendal estates, St. Paul's owned six in our area in the old borough of Wilsdon, including Wilsdon and Bronsbury, that's the area here. Um, so that actually continued till quite late in the day until the uh, building of the land started with the coming of the railways in the Victorian times. However, the uh, a couple of uh, prebendary stalls still exists to this day, and they are now honorary appointments. For example, the prebend of Chamberlain's Wood, that's Kensal Rise and Kensal Green area, is the uh, vicar of a local church there, and it's more like an honorary appointment at the moment. Um, and that's why we have the names of the road, uh, of, the, uh, of the streets in the area connected with St. Paul's Cathedral, and very often this would be the officials or lands associated with it, but here the connection is very clear. St. Paul's Avenue, that's St. Paul's Cathedral, there's a Dean Road nearby and a Chapter Road, and the street called the Chapter Road used to go all the way up to where St. Paul's Avenue now, and the name was changed in 1907, and that's um, quite, um, because uh, St. Paul's Avenue bit of the Long Chapter Road was closer to the station, so they thought that it's probably, sounds a bit better, it's a bit posher to call it St. Paul's Avenue. Um, coming back to the map of 1870, we can see that by then the area was still quite rural, despite the coming of the railways earlier, uh, stations were not built around here, so the actual building didn't start till the coming of the station. So by 1870, Wilsdon Green here had a few big 
houses and the farms in between them. The biggest one in the area was uh, Brondesbury Park and Brondesbury House and we spoke about them during the first lecture of Queen's Park and here we have a Wilsdon House right next to the spotted dog farm and the Wilsdon House um, looked something like that. It was in the possession of various families at, at one point it belonged to a Wade family, including George Wade, who was a dental surgeon. And next to it, as we saw on the map, was the Spotted Dog Public House. And this is also one of the oldest buildings in the area. Uh, the Victoria History of Middlesex mentions the dog of 1751. and. Uh, this is the oldest picture we have of the pub. Um, you can see how rural the area was. Um, in the 19th century it was run by the Twyford family and um, the father used to run it first and then his son came over, took over this farm and they opened another one called Spotted Dog further up in Neesden. So at some point Neesden had two Spotted Dogs farms. In 1817, an advert described the area as a retired pleasant village um, and people used to take uh, carriage drives to Wilsdon and the Spotted Dog to spend some time in the country because it was the depth of the countryside. Um, by 1881, the Spotted Dog became quite an important local attraction. It had pleasure grounds, um, and it was quite a popular spot to come and spend the afternoon. In 1881 it was rebuilt and then it looked like this uh, in the lower photograph where the facade remained the same to this day. And then in the beginning of the 20th century it got even bigger. It had a motor car house, a billiards room and a dance hall. And um, Interestingly, you can see that there is a um, sort of area where the horse cart came in and there's like a little island. And in the next picture, you can see that the bus stops between that island and the actual pub. And that was very useful for Wilsdon being like a major transport hub by this time. They had trams coming in the beginning of the 20th century connecting Wilsdon to Cricklewood and to Kilburn High Road and the traffic, uh, they had the regular transport links. So this was the little island um, for the buses. 1992 you can see the pub still looked quite the same um, its frontage, it even had the little island, um, but it ta its time came in 2006 when the pub was closed and sold to developers who sub uh, submitted a proposal to build 44 flats with a retail unit underneath, but they did keep the frontage. The frontage thankfully remained the way it was in the old times and now the entrance of the Costa Coffee um, Cafe, you can see still the picture of the spotted dog. The um, spotted dog came to fame when our local author Zadie Smith wrote her first book, a novel called The White Teeth in 2000. Um, that novel became a bestseller and an international hit and won quite a lot of awards and it's all about people um, growing up and um, meeting in Wilsdon and in the local area and she actually mentions the spotted dog and the characters coming in to have a drink in it. Um, Zadie Smith grew up in Wilsdon and she went to local schools and then she went to university and she actually finished her first novel um, during her final year, I think it was in Cambridge. And having traveled around the world, she and her family settled and 
in Kilburn, first in Queen's Park and then in Kilburn, and now she actually lives in Kilburn and is spotted in the local area quite often. In 2012, she wrote a novel called NW, which is the first in letters of the postcode for Kilburn, Northwest. Um, so she's our, our local famous author. Going back to the um, map of Wilsdon, here, here's the Wilsdon house, the spotted dog, and further along it's actually farms. There's the Wilsdon Green Farm and Wilsdon Farm here, and they are roughly where we have um, Villiers Road now, and they were indeed farms. Wilsdon Farm on the south side of the road, of Wilsdon High Road, was also called Bramley's Farm and um, it was owned by the Nicol family who were large landowners in the area and she sold it to the United Land Company who uh, then sold on small plots to builders to build on and at some point at the end of the century they owned 17 estates the United Land Company in the area so they were big landowners and then opposite it we had um, on the land belonging to All Souls College Oxford Wilsdon Green Farm and they used to produce hay and milk to take to sell in London and brought back the manure um, for the farm fields. For those of you who live in Wilsdon or who have had some experience here of trying to do gardening or allotments as I do, you'd probably know that here we are on solid clay and it is wet, very rich clay um, which is difficult to grow anything on. So the, uh, the lands of Wilsdon and going even further in Kilsbury, in, uh, to Kingsbury traditionally were used to produce hay and farming which involved um, cows and things like that uh, rather than growing crops. And this was very useful being so close to London because um, horses were the Victorian engine that drove everything so London was full of horses they always needed clay always needed hay so that kind of works worked and what changed um, what started the development of housing was oh sorry I'll go going back to these slides that's Chaplin Road and Villiers Road the site of Bramley's or Wilsdon Green Farm uh, as um, by the turn of the century once they have been built on. And what made the change from hay farming to residential development was the coming of the railways and the building of the station. That's the first incarnation of Wilsdon Green and Cricklewood station as it was called at the time, which was opened on the Metropolitan Railway, later Metropolitan Line, in 1879 um, and um, sorry I've just realized I forgot oh no I didn't didn't forget the recording I think it is recording sorry about that um, the coming of the railway so the first station um, when this picture here must be around the um, around 1910 or after certainly after 1906 because you can see that there's a tram coming along the tram lines and this lovely picture from the archives dated 1908 is the first car to Wilsdon um, quite a popular affair by the looks of it and even before uh, but by the t by then uh, Wilsdon became um, a major junction it had lots of buses and rail and the cars and then we have the coming of the ra railways on top of that um, unless I write it down I never remember the sequence of the lines that the 
uh, Wilson Green Station was on. So it was first Metropolitan Line. Then in 1939, it also served the Stanmore branch of the Bakerloo Line. Met services withdrawn in 1940. And then in 1979, it was transferred to Jubilee Line, which it is now. And in 1937, a new station was built by Walter Clark, uh, the, uh, sorry, 1925, the station was rebuilt um, to the designs of Walter Clark, uh, who was the Metropolitan Railways architect. And he had this trademark uh, faience, that is white glazed tiles, which are still there today. Um, and also his trademark was the square, the, um, rectangular clock. So next time you go past the station, do look up and have a look of this amazing shape of the clock, which is still there exactly as it was. Another feature that is preserved is the tiles, the green mosaic tiling of the ticket hall. This is also the original feature. And um, uh, this is some of the reasons why the station was Grade 2 listed in 2006. It's still looking absolutely beautiful. The platform here, you can see that it's still called Wilsdon Green and Cricklewood Station. It had a waiting room that was heated by coal fires and you can see that it was quite popular because people would live in Wilsdon and commute to London as they do today. Um, the current station here still has the platforms of the original Metropolitan Line which are not used on a regular basis but they are fully functional and if the um, underground needs them they can bring them back into operation. At the moment there's quite a lot of planting going on. You can see like uh, the Wilsdon uh, town team I think it is created quite a lovely garden and there is a very enthusiastic uh, group of gardeners who plant things uh, for their commuters to enjoy. The Metropolitan um, Railways decided to build some housing for their officials and in 1898 a huge block of flats went up. I think it had something like 42 uh, four-bedroom flats. Um, which was called Rutland Park Mansions for their officials. And um, it's continued to be quite a nice place to live until by the 1980s it fell into the hands of the council and the council wanted to create um, council flats there, affordable housing for um, council people, but uh, they couldn't find the money and they couldn't get organized and things sort of dragged on until squatters took in. Between 1980 and 1990s, it was labeled as the biggest squat in Europe. And a lot of people from South Africa and Australia and New Zealand would come and stay there because they knew people who were already there and they formed um, a community and among that community there were quite a few people who were skilled at various things and they were saying that they would like to take over the building and run it themselves but the council would not agree to that although the council's aim was to provide housing for council tenants yet they could not negotiate with the people who were already there uh, to come together. So it all came to an end on 12th of December 1993 when the council finally um, got the eviction order and managed to evict them. Uh, there's a video on YouTube that shows, it's an amateur video so it's sort of jumpy and not very good quality, but it shows the actual eviction process and the um, Police cars came in huge force and the squatters came and sang songs to the accompaniment of their guitars and there wasn't trouble or anything so that police presence wasn't really necessary. But anyway, um, 
they managed to evict the squatters and um, now it is run by a housing association and there is an area uh, Rutland Park Gardens behind it that has quite nice housing as well um, the area continued to grow and just like any metropolitan area around London at that time, people realized that it was a good idea to live in the suburbs as nice houses and then commute using the railways to work in central London. And this was the time when the whole area of Wilsdon was experiencing a building boom. In the 1890s, four houses were built in the area every day and it was the fastest growing district in London. And, of course, like any district, it had everything that you could possibly want in there. Starting with the bank, of course. In 1902, we got this wonderful building um, of the London and South Western Bank, designed by Edward Gabriel, in a style that is called Corporate Baroque. And London and South Western Bank, um, they decided that it will be good to have um, a connection with accounts in London and um, uh, for people in the southwest of England, like Devon and Cornwall. So they decided to set up a chain of banks over there and connect it to London accounts. The idea, the idea didn't quite work. Um, and then they realized that it's actually a much better proposition to build branches in the newly built areas of metropolitan London. And uh, by um, 1918, they had about 200 branches in uh, the areas around central London. And then they were bought by Barclays Bank, Bank in 1918 and has been owned by Barclays Bank ever since then and when this building was listed it was stated that it is an example of a building that has not um, changed its purpose since it was built it is still Barclays Bank and when you go past have a look at this cartouche here because it still has the monogram of London and South Western Bank on it of course it had the shops, it had a huge variety of shops and this is just a small selection. Um, Brent Archives has a, have a lovely collection of local history postcards and they have um, a lot, a lot of local shops around here and of course it had the services. It had, um, this is an advert for a hairdresser and um, laundries. At some point, they had 15 laundries, mostly in Villiers Road. It was like an important part of the small industry of the area. At the post office, uh, which is quite, uh, it is um, still post office today in Lechmere Road, which is sort of all the way here. And then, of course, the time came to create a library. And our Wilsden Green Library and came to be in 1894 and uh, we have a wonderful resource there is an article written by Philip Grant who I believe is with us here today uh, which details the history of the Wilson Green Library to um, in such great huge detail that if you ever wanted to know anything about it that's the um, place to go and it is available from from Brent Museum and Archives website. It came the library in 1894 so it would be the first drawing of it and it was library number three to be opened by um, Wilsdon local board at the time. Uh, the history of libraries is very interesting because in 19 in 1850 uh, there was a um, Free Libraries Act, um, which allowed local boards to establish um, free libraries, but they were not actually free. They were free to use for people, but in order to establish a library, the local board would have a vote to raise a tax 
from the local taxpayers to get the money to set up a library. So they still had to pay. And that was not just, uh, that was just for the building and fixtures and fittings, but not for books. The books uh, were often donated or bought later. And that was the case with the um, Wilsdon, um, Wilsdon Green Library. The local board passed a resolution to establish three libraries. The first one was in Kilburn, then there was one in Neasden, and this was number three. And they came in quick succession in the first part of 1894. Our library here opened with a lovely concert on 18th of July. Um, oh, at the time when it opened, it had a single story building here and the lovely frontage that we can still see today. That's the frontage here. Uh, when the library opened, they had four 1968 books which were mostly donated and a 21 year old librarian called Frank Channel and he lived in the first floor flat must be around here um, and promoted the services of the library he retired in 1937 as head of the local libraries um, the area grew quite dramatically and by 1901 they were lending 70,000 books a year so they needed a bigger premises of course they had to find the money for it and they remembered that in 1900 um, Kensal, Green, Kensal Rise Library had a donation from Andrew Carnegie a Scottish immigrant who um, did well in America and he donated 3, 000, and he was a great philanthropist. He donated three thousand pounds to Kensal Green to Kensal Rise Library, and um, they decided to ask him to do the same for Wilsdon, and he did. So he gave them the money, which was used to enlarge the building, and now you can see that it has two stories in its wings. We can look inside and see what it was uh, like um, at the turn of the century. And this picture from Brent Library and Archives uh, shows a tea party for elderly residents given by a guy called Stanley Ball. And he was an official of the Wilsdon Local Board whose hobby was to take photographs. He used to take lots of pictures on glass plates and then uh, they ended up in Brent Museum and Archives and they form an amazing research um, resource for us. The reading room in the 1960s not that much changed although the library was in need of enlargement and development and nothing really happened till the 1980s when um, the council having bought the land behind this building which became the car park they were talking about enlarging it and then they decided to knock the old building completely and just start again basically and the council passed a resolution with just two votes to demolish the historic Victorian building but there was a huge public campaign by Wilsdon Local History Society and uh, some local councils councillors like Len Snow who was a local historian and the campaign was successful the library old library building was saved the new building that you can see here um, came up in 1989 and um, it had a bookshop, the library, um, it had uh, exhibition spaces, it had a cinema, Bellevue Cinema there, it, ha it had a cafe and a car park behind it and a little square which they used for various events. Uh, Brent Museum from 2006 and Brent Archives from 2009 were there as well. But then they decided that they needed to improve the library. Not only they wanted to improve the library, they actually needed to raise some money. So they made a deal with a property developer, Galliford Try, to um, give them the land that was the car park to build big blocks of flats and... Um, as part of their contract, 
Galliford Tri will build them a new library centre on the 30% of the land and the rest would be uh, flats for sale. And again, the council decided to demolish the historic Victorian building. And again, there was a huge public campaign. Uh, people signed petition, went on the streets, um, local organizations joined in, and the old building was saved. They were forced to come up with a new design that incorporated the old building. Um, it is arguable whether um, people like it or not, but the most important thing is that it was saved. The Victorian building is like the most important and the main asset of Wilson High Road and it is still with us today. Um, right, following on from the library, there was a police station and uh, came in 1896 and um, it was quite a big police complex um, until it closed in 2013 and sold to developers who wanted to convert it into flats but as late as 2020 they were denied a planning permission to do so and that is because Wilsden Green is now a conservation area designated in 1993 and the reason for it is because it was um, basically a Victorian re residential street, a Victorian uh, shopping street and it still retained a lot of features so they do want to preserve it and in the local document, the designation document, it says that um, the opposite side of the Baptist Church and the police station have, has a lively rhythm, rhythm of gables um, Oh, sorry, Mr. Ward Gables. It should be a lively rhythm of gables over here. So do have a look as you walk along Wilsden High Road. It's worth looking up to see all the lovely Victorian features. Next to the police station is the Baptist Church. It has been recently renovated and inside it there is a plaque which is this photograph of and it has the most wonderful wording. It says, Wilsden Green Baptist Church was planted by Charles Haddon Spurgeon and dedicated in 1882. I love the word planted. And um, there's a picture of him inside the church as well and he was one of the most famous preachers of the Victorian era. He used to preach in the tabernacle in um, Elephant and Castle to 5,000 people and he had a huge following so they remember him in the church. It has been recently re renovated in 2021, has just opened and is the center of a lively congregation of people from Africa and from anywhere in England has got a very uh, dynamic multicultural following. And opposite we have the church, the parish church of St. Andrews. And this was um, the parish of St. Andrews was, was formed in 1880 because before then, if you remember the little church of St. Mary's all the way at the other end of Wilsden High Road, that covered the whole area. But of course, with the growth of the population, they needed a much bigger, uh, with mu many more people, they needed a new Anglican church there and it became uh, St. Andrews. It had its own schools. And the new building uh, came in 1887 and later was extended. It has a seating for, for a thousand people, uh, so it is quite big. And it served the local population. It had a soup kitchen, it had all sorts of activities, it had the vicarage, and um, it was a big community center as well. But as the times are changing and more multicultural population comes into Wilsdon, they faced the um, realization that not as many people go to Anglican churches as they used to in the Victorian times. So in 1991 they combined the parish with the local parish of St. Francis and Assisi and now that's the official name of the church. The schools which are opposite are now um, part of an Islamic college which is a major educational establishment for 
um, to study Islamic culture and religion and their degrees are validated by uh, the Middlesex University and they develop quite a huge complex on the opposite side of the road. Ah, the bricks, as you can see, uh, the church is made with red bricks and they're quite famous because the brickworks where they were made was right behind um, the church here on Chambers Lane. Uh, and it was owned by this gentleman here. His name was George Furness and one of our local historians, Cliff Wadsworth, called him the Wilsdon most famous resident. He was a contractor by public work of public works. That was his main occupation. And contractor of public works is someone who negotiates a contract for engineering projects like drainage or railways and then um, manages the project by getting the materials, providing workforce and things like that. And he did a lot of um, projects. He took part in the construction of, of embankment in London and he worked all over the world um, in Italy and South Russia, places like that. So he had quite a lot of experience. He lived in a place called Roundwood House, which in um, later, after his death, that was sold and became the um, Roundwood Park. Um, he was a local resident and when Wilsdon Local Board was formed in 1875, he became its first chairman. And then he realized that the building work going on all around Wilsdon will require a lot of bricks. So he bought an estate which was around the Grange House in Chambers Lane, that's the Grange House here, um, and he created the brickworks and um, I mentioned the lovely 100% pure clay that Wilsdon stands on. He used that clay to make bricks for a lot of streets locally and that's them making bricks. Um, including the church, uh, there were a couple of schools that used his bricks and interestingly he made two types of bricks, durable red bricks uh, which were more expensive and cheaper brown version and looking at St. Andrew's Church, I lost St. Andrew's Church, yes, um, you can see that to me it looks very red and very bright so they must have been the better quality bricks for the church. Um, they also made vases, flower pots and other things, so they were quite a big feature. And that's Chambers Lane, uh, where uh, the area sort of goes up and uh, meets Sidmouth Parade now. Of course, they had to have a school, uh, a church for the Catholic population as well. Their nearest church was in Kew Road in um, Kilburn. As the area grew, they needed a church as well. So the um, Westminster Ca Royal Catholic Mission bought a plot of land in Lineacre Road and built a little church there, which they called Our Lady of Compassion Church. And with it, there was a local school uh, because they wanted to educate children in the Catholic faith. Nearby, in Halsden, from 1880s, uh, there was a church, a, a school set up by an organization called the Religious of Jesus and Mary and they called that school the Convent of Jesus and Mary and that was a boarding school for girls. Um, and this Religious of Jesus and Mary was a um, group of Catholic nuns founded by Claudine Thevenet, a French nun, who decided to devote her life in establishing schools for Catholic um, education for children all over the world. It still exists today. They have two establishments which they run in England, but they had many more in India offering Catholic education there. So they had a school in Halsden and the nuns from the school used to walk along the country lanes to Wilsden Green to teach Catholic children of Wilsden on a Sunday. It grew and grew and they realized that they actually need to build a separate school which was attached to the church and that still wasn't enough. The church was quite small. Um, they had at some point 
um, space for 300 people. That's the inside of that church, little church of Our Lady of Compassion that was in Linnaica Road. Um, with a space for 300 people, they used to get 3,000 people for services on a Sunday. So they were in desperate need of doing something about it. They bought a site which was next to the brickworks. It was called Brickfield because they used to get the, the clay to make the bricks from it. Right behind St. Andrew's Church of Halsden Road and decided to build a school there. But... The, there was opposition from St. Andrew's Church who said, we have our own school, we don't want a competing one right across the road. So what they decided to do is to build the church on that side and build the school on the former church side in Linnaker Road. And that all happened in 1939. They built the new church and they spent quite a lot of money and then they received a bequest from the Ayer family of nine and a half thousand pounds which at the time was a huge amount of money and they were very glad but with the bequest came the condition that the new church should be renamed St Mary Magdalene's so that became the name of the new church and the new school associated with it and now there are three educational establishments um, there is a Royal Catholic primary school on Park Road, just around the corner from Wilsdon High Road, and then that's till the age of seven. Uh, then uh, children go to St Mary Magdalene's School in Linacre Road till the age of 18, and then the uh, old convent of Jesus and Mary was renamed uh, St Claudine's School um, language and became a, an academy and a language college. That's where children go on from here. Um, Methodists had their own church at um, the other end of Wilsdon High Road. Um, it was set up by Welsh Calvinistic Methodists because there was quite a big Welsh community as well. And um, it had that picture here. Um, from Presbyterian Church of Wales, 1914, it says that it must be one of the first views of one of the first pictures or photographs of the representative of the black community in the local area. We see a couple of black children here. Um, next to the Welsh Methodist uh, Church, they set up a school. Um, in 1955 it was in the chapel which is a little residential building next to the church and between the um, until 2006 it remained the only Welsh medium school outside Wales which taught Welsh curriculum they had huge problems at some point because they were teaching Welsh curriculum so they were not eligible for funding from English authorities and they couldn't get funding from the Welsh authorities because they were outside Wales um, but they still went on till 2000 until the building was sold and they had to move and then finally um, they moved into their own premises in South London where the Welsh school still exists today. The reason they were the only school until 2006 is because another Welsh one was opened in that year but that wasn't in England that was in Argentina in Patagonia because apparently there's a big Welsh-speaking community there. Um, the Welsh community diminished, the congregation became so small that they had to sell the building in um, tells me 1995 I think, yes 1995 the building was sold to an organization called the True Buddha Temple. Um, this is a Buddhist sect founded in, uh, popular in Taiwan and East Asia, but they're actually banned in China. And um, they were set in 1975 by a gentleman called Lu Shen Yan, and he has a status, status of a living Buddha. So he is like the head person there. They have huge following in Southeast, in Asia and other countries and 1991 they came to the UK and then took over the building and created a, 
their own uh, their own uh, place of worship there, the true Buddha temple, which is still there today. And sometimes if they have ceremony, they are very colorful, very beautiful. And there is a film on YouTube as well, which shows this visit here and their colorful processions. That's, that's what it is there today. Not far from it, a little further in uh, Heathfield Park, there was a synagogue. And this was set up in 1930s uh, because then a growing Jewish community was looking to develop as well. Um, this was a lovely modernist style building uh, which served the uh, very active, very big Jewish community in Wilsdon and um, right well into the 1960s and in the 1960s they decided that they really need to expand and they bought a site behind this building here which fronts Brondesbury Park and built a bigger extension there. However, after sort of into the 70s, 80s, the Jewish community moved further to areas like Golders Green. The numbers declined and they had to close quite a few of the establishment. And they decided to sell the original building in 1998 and uh, just concentrated on the building in Brondesbury Park. But then again in the 2000s, the Jewish community started to grow again and with the arrival of Rabbi Baruch and his wife, um, the congregation started to grow. They had services for young people, a lot of people with families moved into the area. So there was a scope to develop a new synagogue. So they rebuilt the building. This is the new building, uh, which was finished in 2021, but apparently it hasn't been opened yet. It's just about in its very last finishing stages. So there's a growing Jewish community here as well. Um, and when the building was sold, it was bought by an organization called the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God. And they come from Brazil. Um, this is one of the organizations that had quite a lot of controversy about it. Like they were called a cult and they had allegations of cult-like activities. The guy who founded it owns a TV station and that's all became sort of commercial and there were quite a few scandal things, but just like everything else, there's a good side to them as well, because they position themselves as a help center saying, if you need help, come and talk to us, we'll help you. And they're very big. There's a big um, community for Brazilian, Portuguese speaking and people in Wilsdon. And uh, this particular branch offers services in Portuguese. And they have a soup kitchen, which was very active during the latest pandemic. So they do quite a few good things as well. Right. Um, we move to entertainment because with everything else, the high street of the new area had to have some fun things as well. And they built a cinema. Rutland Park Cinema opened in 1912. And um, seated 500 people had a garden behind it where amongst the trees um, they served refreshments and we have a picture of what it looked like inside it was quite popular um 23 it became a dance hall then a billiard saloon but like everything else by the 1960s the area was in decline and the building became run down and in the 1980s it was knocked out knocked through and now is Ellis Close which is the approach to Sainsbury's. It was named after James Ellis who was a surveyor and a property developer and lived in a house called the Poplars which was nearby and there's a Poplar Avenue that goes right behind it so they retained it in the names. This looks strange and weird and this wall looks even stranger and more rundown but wait for a few months when this wall here will be transformed into a lovely new mural sponsored by the brand council and Wilsdon town team and it will be lovely and colorful and represent the community of Wilsdon Green. 
should happen before summer, I hope. So in the 1960s, uh, a lot of small industries that were popular, uh, that were around in Wilsdon, uh, were moving out uh, further afield. The area became run down. Not enough money went into it. Um, but in the 1980s, the council decided that actually something needs to be done in a big way because the area was quite sad. And that's when money was given for the regeneration of the area and uh, the new supermarket, Summerfield at first, which is now Sainsbury's, came along. Um, among the sort of local beautiful landmarks, we lost Electric House. And many people remember it as a lovely Art Deco building, which was electric, electric goods showroom and offices. And um, it was where people would come to buy their electric goods and they would give demonstrations how to use your new electric hob or how to use your new um, washing machine. Because people didn't know what they were, so they were doing like little workshops and you would also go there and pay your bills. In 19... 85 it became offices and one of the organizations renting space there was called network stadium homes and they had had the office there and then in 2014 they um, suggested to the council a project where they would knock the old building down and build um, a group of 20 five apartments in a seven-story block which they did and it was a great shame because this was the beautiful building went down that's there without any building at all and that's the new building it does look quite beautiful but nothing like the old art deco thing we had before um a few things that happened during the war um the um the first world war is commemorated by this um plaque here which is in Lechmere Road oh, yes I do say it's Lechmere Road here just on the floor here and this was installed in 2014 as part of commemorations of Victoria Cross holders across the country and every Victorian Cross holder whom they could trace received a paving stone installed in a special ceremony this was number two installed because it happened quite early in the wars and it, co it, commemorates, it commemorates a local man called Charles Garforth and he was born in Chaplin Road and at 22 when the First World War started he joined up and on the 23rd of August in Belgium he um, his squadron was trapped under enemy fire and couldn't escape and he cut the wire under the fire which enabled his people to um, the squadron to escape and save their lives quite a few people and he did two more acts of bravery for which he was awarded Victoria Cross when he came um, when he returned from the war he lived a long and happy life in the north of England and died in 1973 and then his memory was commemorated here and his medals the uh, actual Victoria Cross and his other medals are in the National Army Museum the Second World War there was a lot of industry particularly around the church end area and a lot of um, factories changed their profile to uh, make munitions for the um, and make various equipment for the war effort so a lot of bombing did come Wilsdon way and in October 1940 a greater tonnage of bombs fell on Wilsdon than on East Ham so there was quite a lot of destruction Borough Wilsdon invested collected some money and bought a Spitfire which they called Borough Wilsdon and they specified that they would like it to be flown by a fighter a pilot from a Polish squadron um, because they were quite famous for their skill and bravery and they did so this is the picture of the Spitfire called um, Borough Wilsdon and there's a plaque in the Brent archives commemorating the fact unfortunately uh, the pilot and the plane went missing in June 1942 another thing commemorating the war is this big sign this picture was taken a few months ago. Someone actually goes and paints St. Paul's pianos um, as a ghost sign on the corner of Lineker Road. 
and there used to be a piano shop there called St. Paul's Piano. Um, and um, it had a piano there, which used to belong to a lady called Mrs. Lena Ford. And she was the author of the... Um, she wrote the words to a famous song during the wartime, Keep the Home Fires Burning. She was killed, but her piano survived and was later displayed in the shop in Wilsdon as the symbol of people's resilience during the war. And they, the St. Paul's pianos, they actually had two premises. They had a workshop where they restored and made pianos further up Wilsdon, down Wilsdon High Road, and they had a showroom further here. In the 1920s, the area must have been quite jolly because they had four piano makers, two gramophone dealers, and two music stores. And this information, there's a wonderful resource done by a local historian, Dick Wandling, and it's music maps, which shows every single music person, music shop, or anything with music connections in uh, Wilsdon, um, well, it's more sort of Kilburn area, and it's on this website here. That's an amazing research, which I used for later as well. Um, in the 60s, the um, Brent, um, Barrow Brent was formed in 1965, um, incorporating Wilsdon and Wembley and they had one of their offices they had like a huge building here called Quality House and it used to have registry office and a lot of people have lovely memories of getting married there um, and then in 2012 it became retirement homes which you can see there now um, also in the 1960s music connections we had at number 13 High Road Wilsdon, which is Fly Uni, this blue building here, now used to be a record shop called Musicland, uh, run by Lee Goptel, who was um, uh, he was a, a young man of Indian origin who grew up in Jamaica, and when he came to London, he loved Jamaican music so much that he decided to uh, start importing and selling records. So in 1966, he set up a shop. And then a year later, with a guy called Chris Blackwell, they set up Trojan Records uh, with the head office at Music House in Nisden Lane, which is now Brent Magistrates Court. And Trojan Records was, um, they were importing and selling um, reggae records from Jamaica, um, not only to um, immigrants, Jamaican immigrants, but also to anyone who... Um, was in England and they sort of uh, brought it, brought reggae music to a global audience and they were instrumental in doing that. They popularized reggae music in England. Um, later on, this must have remained a music um, store throughout because uh, Musicland closed in the 1970s and then this became Spinet Records, a big record shop that stayed there right into 1990s. And it used to have quite a few famous people going to buy records there because um, about uh, 15 minutes walk down Wilson High Road, we had Morgan Studios set up in 1967 founded by Barry Morgan and his friends, and they were one of quite a few progressive little studios that sprang all over London at the time that had eight-track recording equipment and were quite easy to book and actually had good facilities. So very quickly you can see a list of people who used to come and record there late 60s, early 70s. It was sold to various organizations and it is still a recording studio now called Miloco Studio. Studios. Um, in the 1960s, a Pakistani community came to Brent as well. Um, as you know, a lot of uh, people from the former countries of the British Empire started coming to England to find work after the war in the 1950s. And a lot of people who came, they sort of um, hold on to the, their community, people whom they knew, friends and relatives who had a support network. And there was a quite big Pakistani community around Cricklewood and that area there. 
um, in the in 1965 there was a big dam building project in Pakistan and a lot of people were displaced and many came to go and find work here and uh, one of the reasons they came to areas like Cricklewood is because there was a lot of industry there at the time and a lot of um, work that did not require a good command of spoken English so there was work for them there. Pakistan Workers Association 1965 and then there was a mosque committee and they decided to build a big new mosque for their community which was um, inaugurated in 1988. It is just behind the uh, Wilsdon Green station and this picture is taken from the platform of Wilsdon Green. It also came to prominence in 2021 as the first combined vaccination and testing centre in the UK. And this is Councillor Tariq Dar, um, who came to Brent from Pakistan at the age of 13 in 1965. And he uh, was quite a prominent figure in the local council. He became member of the British Empire and he set up a food bank um, in the mosque centre here. Um, coming to the sort of the last couple of things about the very recent developments is the murals that decorate Wilsdon Green and one of them is this one here uh, which you can see as you come out of the Wilsdon Green station and you meet this lovely Lewis the cat who is named after the inspiration of Lewis Wayne and Lewis Wayne, Wayne had the reputation of the man who drew cats. He was actually a local man. He lived at Brondesbury Road at some point, uh, together with his sisters, whom he looked after. Uh, he went to an art school at an early age. He was quite talented. And um, he developed a love for cats when his sisters gave him a kitten for his 20th birthday. And he drew them doing things like people do. It's sort of caricatures of um, people's of human life but through cats. Um, it's called anthropomorphism. At some point he was doing 600 drawings a year for the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News and the Illustrated London News which was the hello magazine of the time. He was extremely popular. He had postcards done, reproduced it in the journals, and everyone thought he was amazing. However, he became ill. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And when, after the First World War, he was not so popular anymore, he ended up in Napesbury Hospital uh, with schizophrenia. Uh, by then, his drawings became more and more abstract and he was doing things like that, whether it was connected to his sort of vision, whichever was happening with his mental health. Um, he had a very long, interesting, disturbing and amazing life, which was made into a film which has just come out. I believe it is on now in various cinemas around London, including some local ones. I haven't seen it. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And there was an exhibition in 2011 at Wilsdon Library. But before then, where's my cat? Yes, in 20, uh, uh, before the film in 2014, we had the mosaic, inspired by Louis Wayne's work, um, done by local artist Deborah Collis and the members of the community, and it was a project by Wilsdon Town Team. And then in 2016, uh, they did a second mosaic, and they called it Earther. It's in Poplars Avenue. It was unveiled in 2016 in a ceremony for the local community by Leslie Jones, who was the mayor of Brent at the time. But this picture shows my daughter Lilia rather stealing the show from the mayor of Brent and obviously saying something for the journalists. Um, another couple of mosaics are from very recent, from 2019. And this one here says, welcome, right by the Wilsdon station. There's also a mosaic which says Wilsdon on the opposite side, right by Lewis Wayne. And there's another one in um, approach to Sainsbury's on the wall here. And um, they were done by a collective known as Static. 
static is the signature here and that's Craig Evans and Tom Jackson who are experienced mosaic artists they did quite a few murals in Church End and further down Wilsdon High Road as well and um, they invited a local lady called Andrea Vargas and she helped them with the design so they're absolutely stunning and as I mentioned two more murals coming up our way in um, there'll be one by uh, Sainsbury's uh, nearby uh, by the wall and one in Ellis Close but done by a different artist so look out for the brightening up of Wilsdon Green and um, these are some sources that um, I have uh, for the creation of the lecture I will uh, have the this this will be available as a recording so everyone will be able to see that and we are Wilson Local History Society have a look on our website we produce a journal twice a year uh, we also organize lectures presentations and local history walks and we do lots of fun activities um, this project is part of uh, Brand Heritage um, Walks and Trails, which was sponsored by the um, National Lo uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, and we developed um, fun trails for children. It says suitable for all ages because we found that quite a few of adults who tried to do it with their children enjoyed it just as much, if not more. But it's just a fun activity, quite easy to do, and they're downloadable from website our brand heritage website and also they should be available in local libraries we distributed quite a few copies in the local libraries um, I will send a link to everyone uh, about the feedback so if people can provide us feedback um, we, we don't see it it goes straight to brand council and they use it to assess, assess the success of this project so hopefully if they like it they will let us do more tours all around the borough of Brent so thank you very much everyone i will stop sharing the screen and we can have questions right <laughs>